Hi everyone, this is Jason Barrack of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, but um, I regretfully have not had him on uh, a lot sooner. Uh, he's an expert in the oil and natural gas industry. He's Keith Schaefer, editor and publisher of the Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin, where he specializes in covering small and intermediate Canadian oil and natural gas companies. So thank you for joining us on a podcast again, Keith. Jason, thanks for having me. Now, um, Keith, uh, before we talk about maybe some of the, the individual oil companies and uh, the stuff they're going through, I, I want to look at the, your view of the uh, macroeconomic view, 30,000-foot view of the oil market. Uh, oil prices have dropped so much so quickly. Uh, why do you think they did so? Well, I guess there's two real reasons. One, one is that you know the U.S. shale revolution has just been going gangbusters for a couple of years now. The U.S. has been increase, increasing oil production about a million barrels a day a year for the last three years. And demand has been kind of keeping up, but not really. So this is the year we kind of hit the wall where, where we met in demand. And then so what happened last year, Jason, was that when we needed extra production because of Libya falling apart and other things in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia stepped in and added a million barrels a day production. But now that Libya's back online and we don't need that production, the Saudis have said, no, we're not going to give that million barrels a day back. So between those two issues, really that explains the precipitous drop in the price of oil. Like oil was, was, was rolling downhill anyway, but as soon as November 27th hit and the OPEC meeting where the Saudis confirmed that they were not going to give back that million barrels a day of production, we just fell off a cliff. That That's interesting because doesn't the uh, International Energy Agency, the IEA, they're, they're still saying that demand is growing uh, globally. And um, BP, when they put out their statistical review at the beginning of this year, they said that global demand was growing faster than global supply. So you think that has the, – the demand is still growing globally, but it slowed down then? Correct. Uh, I, I haven't totally looked at the, the most up-to-date numbers, but I'd suggest that, that oil demand is only going to go up maybe half a million barrels a day next year, where supply is running about a million to a million and a half barrels more. So yes, we're still seeing demand growth, but just, just not keeping pace with supply. That, that That's interesting because if you look at you know the total inventories, I think in the U.S. and in some other countries, the inventory levels this year for oil are actually lower than they were last year. So there's arguments to be made that you know um, there's not this oversupply glut, but I guess the market interpreted it. The perception in the market was that there was an oversupply glut, that China was slowing down or whatever reasons. And then also you had, what, the strong dollar, too. I guess I think these stu- these stupid trading computers, Keith, uh, you know, when, when they see the dollar is gaining so much uh, strength against the Canadian dollar or the Russian ruble or things like that, they just automatically, you know, start selling off oil or gold. Absolutely. You, you, you hit the nail on the head. You know, uh, and the other thing to think about, uh, Jason, is that, the market doesn't react to what's happening. The market reacts to what everybody thinks is happening. And sometimes those are different things. Like you said, the BP Statistical Review says demand is growing more than that. Well, of course, only history is going to tell us that. But the market thinks that with the China slowdown, um, that's, that's going to happen. So, um, and and the, other, the other thing, Jason, is that you can remember that. So we use 90 million barrels a day. Like, that's a lot. And we're only overproducing right now by just a bit over a million barrels a day. So let, let's say that's somewhere between 1% and 1.5%. That's not what I'd call a lot. So, you know, between anything that could happen in the Middle East, um, you know, uh, the high rate of declines on the shale wells, there's a whole host of factors that could come into play quite quickly to balance that market out. Exactly, and, and that's a great point. And the one, the one thing I like about oil for long-term investment pur- purposes, Keith, is that oil is consumed. It's not like it's copper or steel or aluminum or something like that, and it's easy to recycle. Once it's used and it's consumed, it's basically gone. That's correct, yes. Now, um, I, I want to I wanna get uh, into – uh, the Canadian market, since you cover the Canadian oil and gas market, uh, you're one of the top newsletter writers in that industry. Um, what's your opinion of what the Chinese are doing in Canada? Are the Chinese, um, we've started to see the Chinese announce that they've stocked, they're um, securing enormous amounts of tankers and they're sending oil over, and they're basically doing what they did in 2009. Are they starting to do that in Canada too, in terms of investments in the Canadian oil and gas patch? Well, no. What's really happened here lately is that. Um you know, the, the the Canadian federal government has said we don't want to see Chinese state-owned companies, SOEs, in our market. We're a free market country, and we we, we didn't, you know, we sold off uh, a bunch of stuff in 
of our own, like our Petro Canada stake, and we didn't we didn't do that just so the Chinese could come in and start buying stuff. So for private industry, we're open for business, but for the other stuff, we're not. That that's that's interesting. I mean, I, I think the Chinese are getting that xenophobia type of uh, attitude, not just in Canada, in so many other countries where the the politicians are changing the rules, saying the Chinese can only do. I think in Canada, right, it's a uh, joint venture agreements only now. So the Chinese, I don't think they can own 51 percent of any company, uh, Canadian listed resource company, right? It's like has to be below 50 percent. Right. So, you, you, again, you hit the, the ball right on the bat there. So um, I think we're in a situation now where because they don't really want to do business any other way, uh, we're, we're kind of in this standoff until we can find some way to do business with these guys that works for, for both sides. Now, um, I, I want to talk about um, the Canadian oil and gas industry. Some of our, uh, a lot of our listeners are in the United States. We have a good amount in Canada. For listeners in the United States, um, how is the Canadian oil industry uh, different than the U.S.? Where, where are the majority of the oil deposits in Canada, and uh, what are their production costs uh, normally? You know, the big difference, Jason, isn't so much on the geological side or, or the economic side. It's on the financial side. American companies have a lot more debt. And so what that means is they have huge amount of leverage. So in Canada, because we finance most of our growth through equity, so we issue shares. So our, our oil companies have much bigger share flows. So, so the stocks will be like 100 million, 200 million shares out, whereas in the States there's only 25 million out or 40 million out. So, but we only have a small amount of debt. The Canadians start to get shivers as soon as any of their producers have more than one and a half times debt to cash flow. The states, you can have four times debt to cash flow and hardly anybody blinks. And so what that has meant, this cycle has been stunning because whereas the Canadian producers, the juniors, have lost anywhere from 40 to 60 percent, maybe the, maybe the really small ones are losing 70 percent, all the major U.S. intermediates have been crushed. And like I mean they've lost 80% of their value because the chances of these companies going completely under, off the board, bankrupt, are much greater. And they have a huge amount of junk bond debt. Uh, one third of the entire junk bond market in the United States is energy. So I actually do cover quite a few American companies and keep my eye on a lot of them. And it's really hard to find right now, in, in particularly in a volatile oil environment, uh, U.S. energy stocks that are really worth um, jumping into right now. W once the oil price truly bottoms and we can see a trend happening, they're going to be the go-to place. But in a volatile oil market like we have now, the Canadian market has a lot less risk, uh, a little bit less reward because you've got more shares out. But really, that's kind of where I'm, I'm thinking we need to be for the short term until things kind of bottom out. So, but, but, but you talk about costs and uh, geology, the one thing that makes the big difference, Jason, in the States is that you have formations like the Permian in West Texas where there's like multiple zones. Sometimes you can be producing out of seven or eight different zones out of one well, whereas in Canada it's pretty rare to have more than two, So, and, and quite often it's only one. So it, it really, that, that would be kind of like the big difference. And then, then there's some other differences too, like the, the Bakken is a great example where just through fluke, you know, uh, it's much deeper in the United States, in, in North Dakota, and, and it gets shallower as it moves up into Canada. So you're, the deeper you are, the more pressure there is, so the, the, the higher the flow rate is coming out. So you just get a lot more production out of the Bakken in the U.S. So the... So between the, 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 the more formations and the deeper Bakken, when those are the two big formations in, in the U.S. that are being exploited right now, those would be the, the big differences. That's why your, your cost of production is probably a little bit lower in the United States than it is in Canada. Yeah, I mean, the cost of production, you know, the cash cost of actually getting the oil or natural gas or natural gas liquids out of the well uh, is probably cheaper because there's a lot of, uh, I don't know how much uh, horizontal drilling and hy uh, hydraulic fracking um, is being done in Canada, but it is breakthrough and the, the costs are dropping somewhat as they drill more wells on each pad. 
But that's a great point you brought up about the debt for the shell oil producers. I mean, thanks to the Federal Reserve here in the United States and other uh, banking and monetary policies, these the shell producers and you know Wall Street's uh, propensity to create bubbles, we they've just gotten a humongous amount of artificially cheap debt. And while the oil price was going up or it stayed above 100, everything was fine. The cash flow worked out. But now you know you're seeing the negative aspect of that debt. Um, I think what what we've seen in the shale producers, what they haven't done, what they didn't do correctly, is many of them, you know, did not expect any drop like this in the oil price. They didn't prudently, because of their debt levels, hedge their oil their oil production at a much higher price. They didn't lock in a profit. So some, I, I think, some of these shale oil producers, they are hedged for a little bit, but it's not nearly enough. And I think, like you said, their junk bonds now, it's an enormous amount of the total junk bond market. And I think some of these junk bonds now are like 30% yields, and they're they're pricing in, you know, they're, they're selling for less than 40 cents on the dollar of the bonds, which normally signals huge bankruptcy risk. Yes, you're, you're right on all those counts. You know, it's interesting your comment on the hedging because uh, what really the oil market was a tail – of the first half and second half of the year, right? There was, there was two sides, two very different sides to that coin. So in the first half of this year, we had the polar vortex domestically, and internationally we had the ISIS uh, crisis in Iraq, the, the, the new insurgents in the Middle East. So the oil price went a lot higher in the first half of this year than anybody expected. And so all the producers that were hedged lost money on those hedges. So the, the, the hedge losses across North America in the first half of this year were huge, both on the gas side and the oil side. So uh, the industry was really not in any frame of mind to increase their hedges at all as, as things rolled off. And so then, of course, what happened was in July, it started to slowly roll off, and then it slowly gathered steam right through until October, November, when it just really started to fall off. And so uh, all the producers were in a, not in a frame of mind to do any hedging because they just lost their shirt. They had their biggest hedge losses in years uh, in the first six months of this year. And so they said, oh, we're not going to hedge. Forget it. And so and then look what happened. So well, they, they well, could, Markets are funny. Markets are funny like that sometimes. <laughs> They're counterintuitive, that's right? That's right. So, <laughs> so you're right. They, they didn't they, – they, particularly the juniors and the intermediates, they have way less hedging uh, than, the, um, than the seniors. Now, um, for, for Canada, uh, for, for some of these companies, uh, it, it seems like these Canadian companies, you said they don't have debt. But how are they doing on cash on their balance sheet? So are, are they still are, are are there a good amount of them still able to make an, an oil profit? Have they hedged, uh, even though they don't have debt? Have they hedged some of their production at these costs, and are some of them actually making money at these levels, or are they just treading water then, trying to ride out the storm, and uh, you know hoping the oil price improves in the next year or two, and uh, so they can survive? Well, the Canadian companies all have debt. There's very few companies that don't have debt, so they just don't have as much debt as, as the Yanks. Uh, but no, uh, what we've seen here, Jason, is over the last um, three months, you, you've seen CapEx cutbacks, right? So we started off, everyone's saying, oh, A, we don't need to cut back at all because we can do, uh, we, we, we can survive at $50 oil. If OPEC wants a fight, we'll give them one. So brave talk. Then as this thing kept dropping, it was, okay, we'll cut a CapEx by 10%. Then it was, oh, we'll cut CapEx by 20%. And now you've seen companies right from the smallest to very large companies uh, drop CapEx basically to complete maintenance level, which means that they will only produce enough oil to keep their production flat, to offset the natural declines. So in the last two, three weeks, you've seen just a stunning amount of uh, cutbacks. You know, it's gone from millions of dollars to tens of millions of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars. For each company, like Meg Energy up here, cut their capex back by 600 million bucks. Uh, so everybody here is now in hunker down mode, just trying to uh, offset natural declines, drill as little as possible, so that they can um, really just hold the fort. Because nobody wants to produce in this environment, Jason. Like you think that these shale wells, they produce as much as 30% of the oil they're ever going to produce in the first year. So what the price is for that first year has unbelievable impact on their economics. And so if, if the larger companies can afford to, 
they're going to just drill the wells and not produce them. But for the juniors, well, most of them don't have that luxury. So uh, sadly, they're going to have to keep producing. And of course, some guys that do have hedges are going to have to produce as well. Now, um, for for the Canadian, uh, I, I'm looking for oil. One of the reasons I've been uh, interviewing a lot of oil experts, such as yourself, the last couple of weeks, is I, I think the oil market brings incredible amount of opportunities. Now, normally, when a market you know crashes like this unexpectedly in such a short amount of time, uh, there's big red flags, but there's also tremendous opportunities. Um, do you think there's a lot of good long-term investing opportunities here for people if they do their homework for Canadian companies, companies that maybe are still uh, generating free cash flow at these uh, prices and maybe uh, good uh, income opportunities for investors out there who are looking for yield? Yes and no. Yes, on, on the bigger side with the longer-term horizon. Uh, on the junior side, Jason, I'd say you, if you want, you can go pick your, your spot. Uh, but you don't need to pull the trigger right now. You know, you know, you can figure out where you want to aim your gun right now, but you don't want to be pulling the trigger just yet. So, um, but you, you, probably one of my favorites would be this uh, GMLP, Golar Partners, who trades on Nasdaq around uh, 30 bucks. And so, what they do is is they transport liquid natural gas all over the world. And so, even though Oil, a much lower oil price has really hurt uh, the LNG pricing. They have about a five and a half, six year backlog worth billions of dollars that's already set in stone. Contracts are done for at least five and a half years. So, and, that, and that's yielding about 8% right now. So, that's just a fantastic opportunity. So, yeah, I agree. I covered MLPs as an investment analyst at a larger uh, newsletter company last year. So I think there's a lot of good bargains for income investors out there, either pipeline companies or oil service companies, companies like that who have long-term contracts like what you said. Um, I think those are those are some of the best opportunities right now because a lot of the oil and natural gas producers, they just didn't hedge enough. And um, the, the guys who are actually producing you know, the oil and gas, not the uh, oil service companies or ones like that. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of good opportunities in income for peop for the companies that are not necessarily producing the oil or the gas, now, but are moving it. Yeah. And then the one thing I just added at the end of that conversation is that GMLP, even though it has the letters MLP in the in the symbol, it's not an MLP. It's a C corp. But. Okay. Well, um, my my final question, Keith, has to do with um the LNG market in Canada. Uh, the U.S. seems intent on um it's approved. I think at least four or five. LNG export terminal facilities, including Chenier One uh, in Sabine Pass, I think, in Louisiana. Is uh, Canada also moving forward with the LNG export facilities uh, too? There's a lot of talk right now. Uh, there's two, there's three main projects going on that that have some size to it. And then there's a fourth one that's quite quite small. Um, and, and the first one that's quite small is just north of the city of Vancouver. It'll probably get done uh, and start going in the next six to 12 months, so they're just waiting on final approval. The big one, Jason, that has just been delayed is the Malaysian National Oil Company, whose name is Petronas. Petronas. Uh, they have a, a big two BCF a day plan for Prince Rupert, and they just put uh, that on the shelf for about four or five months while they continue to negotiate with the Canadian government around taxes and depreciation. Uh, so we're very hopeful that that goes ahead sometime early next year. And if it doesn't, then that could be a long time. The second one is, is the third one is Shell. And Shell's got a big one in Kitimat, which is also on the west coast of Canada. So that, that we should see about a year from now, we'll hear about that one, the final investment decision. And then probably the most exciting thing going on in LNG right now, uh, Jason, is, is the floating LNG. So unlike the big land-based terminals that cost billions of dollars, these ones are quite a bit smaller, and they only cost a few hundred million dollars. So, and of course, they can be moved. If, if the economics don't work, well, then you just move it, and you, you can float it away. So you're seeing a group of First Nations in Canada partner up with Golar on that, and, and that could be some really interesting uh, developments here over the next couple of years. So we're watching that very closely. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of opportunities in the LNG market. Um, as long as the companies that are, you know, building these export facilities, they're they're putting out long-term contracts 
So they're not, you know, they're not, it's not like a real estate developer and they're building the houses on spec. They already have the demand there. They already have the contracts in place to ship the gas somewhere. I think that's very important instead of, you know, building these, uh, these facilities cost billions of dollars and then building it on spec that, oh, we'll build the facilities and we'll find the contracts and the demand after we build these things. Exactly. Now, um, Keith, I, I want, I want to, uh, get your 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 final uh, summary here so if i were to summary uh summarize your views of the oil market right now you think people should be cautious they should maybe hold cash do research now uh and if they are looking to buy they should only be looking maybe for either mlps or large companies that don't have too much debt and that are producing some type of income or yield is is that a fair summary or would you characterize your views of the oil market differently well i i'd say that's one angle to take uh like for me I, I'm, I, I play the intermediates because they have the best beta to oil price, so they have the biggest swings. And, and really what I'm doing right now is I'm picking out the top three to five companies in my list, and I'm buying very small positions on really deep red down days. So you don't ever want to buy such a big position right now that you get nervous about the stock. You just only want to buy, like the other day I bought 1,000 shares of, of one of my favorites, uh, at, at fourteen dollars, and uh, today it's seventeen bucks. But I, I don't watch the stock. It, it's such a good company. If I had to buy it next month at eleven for another thousand shares, I'd do that. But um, it's um, that, that, that's how I'm deploying capital right now. Just being patient and putting in small buy orders on the best companies until the charts really tell me I need to jump in. I think that's very prudent, and that's something that the the most retail investors don't do. You know, they normally they read something in like your newsletter or another person's newsletter. And they say, "Oh, this company must be great," and then they go out and put all their money into the stock at once instead of being prudent and buying maybe the uh, splitting up their positions, buying the shares in tranches. Well, you know, the nothing fundamentally has changed about this company. The share price went from 14 down to 10 or something. And, well, look, the oil price hasn't moved. I don't know why. Maybe maybe a mutual fund or a pension fund just dumped the stock for no fundamental reason. So um, I, I think it's, a, it's very prudent to not buy all of your position at one. It's something that the average investor, retail investor, definitely makes a lot of mistakes on. Exactly. Well, um, Keith, I, I just want to thank you again for your time. And uh, please tell our listeners more about your newsletter and how they can find your work. Well, the be best place to learn about uh, what I'm doing is uh, on the website at oilandgas-investments.com. We write two or three free articles a week that really aim to educate the retail investor about the oil market and what opportunities there are out there. Sometimes we get stock-specific, but not too often. But it's a great place where the layman can read about oil and gas and not be talked down to. It's very simple language, no words over nine letters. And our commitment is to really educating uh, people about the opportunities in oil and gas in an in, in unbiased way. So uh, by all means, please visit the website. And if you have uh, any questions, my email is on the site, and they can send me an email. Very good. Well, uh, thanks again for your time, Keith, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back on in a couple months and maybe the oil prices will be higher by then. <laughs> thanks, Jason. You have a Merry Christmas. Thank you.